She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate Everybody. Welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. I had initially heard about this case a few weeks ago from a guy on TikTok, a guy that doesn't even cover true crime, but he does live in Massachusetts. And he was saying that he was surprised more people weren't talking about it. And then I guess the case blew up and national mainstream media started covering it. And so when I first decided to cover it, I really thought it was going to be, you know, a standard, straightforward coffee and crime. I was going to wait until there was an arrest and some sort of resolution because personally, I had my suspicion of who was allegedly responsible from the moment I heard about the case. But what I did not expect was all the twists and turns that I was going to encounter. For days, I just kept digging and digging and finding stuff. And unlike some other currently evolving cases, the information just kept coming. And I'm speaking about the disappearance of 39-year-old Anna Walsh, a mother of three from Cohasset, Massachusetts, who was last seen on New Year's Day 2023. Right from the start, the information coming out about this case gave me Jennifer Dulos vibes, Susan Morphew vibes. And sure enough, Anna's husband, 47-year-old Brian Walsh was arrested on January 8th, 2023. Initially, he was only charged with misleading the police investigation into his wife's disappearance. He pleaded not guilty to that, and he was held on a $500,000 bail. But on January 17th, after the police found several items of evidence, Brian was charged with the murder of Anna Walsh, although authorities have yet to locate her body. And in my opinion, there's a good chance they never will. So we're here to talk about that today. But before we dive into today's video, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and delicious seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You can skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. Listen, I've been cooking with HelloFresh for a few years years now. I truly cannot imagine my life without it because it's made weekly dinners so much more fun and, and simple, easy. You know, if you're looking for a simple way to eat well and save money this year and you want to cut back on expensive dining out or delivery, you should definitely check out HelloFresh because you will love how fast, easy, and affordable it is to whip up restaurant quality meals right in your own kitchen. In fact, it's so funny. We made a couple HelloFresh meals this week and my oldest daughter, Nev, said something like, I love that we can have restaurant like quality food at home like that's awesome you know and it was such a cute comment because it's so true like you will feel that you're eating something that a chef prepared for you even though you made it for yourself Additionally, HelloFresh is 25% cheaper than takeout, and it's also cheaper than going to the grocery store. You also have less food waste, which is a big plus for me because HelloFresh sends you only the ingredients you need to create each specific recipe, and the ingredients are pre-portioned and fresh with them traveling from the farm to you in less than seven days. Those vegetables are not sitting in a grocery store, getting fondled by everybody and their mother waiting for you to come and bring them home after they've already been touched by everybody in town. Ugh. And I really do love that they're pre-portioned, so you're getting just what you need for that recipe because I do not like having to do like a monthly clean out of my refrigerator and then see how much food I wasted because I had to buy an entire thing of like heavy cream and I only needed a cup or I had to buy an entire bag of like shredded cheese and I only needed half a cup and now I'm like throwing things out at the end of the month and I just, I don't like that. It doesn't feel good for me. It's a waste of money 
and it's a waste of food, and I don't like to waste either of those two things. And with over 35 weekly recipes, HelloFresh is sure to have something for everyone, even your pickiest eaters like your kids. You can customize your meals by adding or swapping proteins. You can add proteins to veggie dishes. You can skip a delivery if you know you're going to be out of town, on vacation, or busy that week. Everything is tailored to you, what you like and what works for your life. And I will say I have been really getting into the fast and fresh recipes, which are HelloFresh's latest line of meals. They feature robust flavors and filling portions. I just tried their um, seared steak and potatoes with the Bernays sauce. Oh my God, it was delicious. It was delicious, but best of all, it was ready and on the table in less than 15 minutes, which actually surprised me because I thought that Bernays sauce was going to be far more complicated than it was. But I do actually want to shout out two HelloFresh meals that we made last week because they were both amazing amazing so first we had these ancho chili like smash burgers they were so good they were so like crispy and flavorful on the outside and so juicy on the inside and you can see us making that meal in in the b-roll of this video but then the next night we had a meal that i didn't take any footage of because honestly i thought that it wasn't going to be as good as the burgers it was amazing. It was the Southwest Beef Cavatappi. Um, it was so, like, I can't even explain how good it was. When I first saw the recipe, I was like, oh, I won't take footage of this because it kind of reminded me of like a goulash that my grandmother used to make for me like years ago. Like at first sight, that's what it reminded me of. But it blew me away. It was so delicious. Like, I, I, I don't understand how it was so good. I don't know how something can be so simple to make and so delicious at the same time. I wish I had some right now. In fact, I put my bowl in the fridge with like plastic wrap over it and I never do this. I never eat leftovers, but I put my bowl in the fridge with plastic wrap over it because it was so good and I couldn't eat it all. And then at like two o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I like threw it in the microwave and then I ate it. <laughs> in bed and I sound like a gross person but listen it was that good like I dreamed about it and woke up and had to go have it. HelloFresh is really a blessing to my family and to my taste buds. You should check it out for yourself so you can see what I mean. All you have to do is go to HelloFresh.com and use code StephanieHarlow21 for 21 free meals plus shipping. Once again go to HelloFresh.com or click the link in the description box and use code StephanieHarlow21 for 21 free meals plus shipping. You're going to be so happy that you did. Thank you so much to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. Now let's dive in to the video. Cohasset, Massachusetts is your typical sleepy New England coastal town. Think Chatham, Massachusetts, Rehoboth Beach in Maryland, Block Island in Rhode Island. Cohasset is 20 miles southeast of Boston, and it's located on the corner of the South Shore, where Greater Boston Harbor ends and Massachusetts Bay begins. The town has a total of about 31 square miles, and only 9.8 square miles of that is land. The rest is water. And the 2020 census showed just over 8,000 people living there. It's a quaint, historical town right next door to Hingham, where Abraham Lincoln's ancestors originally settled, and the center of the town is that classic oval New England green, lined with historic white houses, and as you stroll through the village, you'll pass more of these historical homes and landmarks, cute little cafes, specialty shops, and the Red Lion Inn, which has been running since 1704. The classic New England shoreline seems to stretch on endlessly, and the shore of Cohasset is where the wealthy and elite would flee to during the summers to escape the Boston heat during the Gilded Age and into the 1920s, and their grand mansions still perch on the cliffs, overlooking the sea like elaborate sentinels. It is a completely picturesque, beautiful, and peaceful-looking place. But what happened to Anna Walsh here is far from picturesque and peaceful. Anna was originally from Serbia, but she moved to Boston, where she met a man named Brian Walsh, who at that time was the son of a prominent neurosurgeon in the Boston area, Dr. Thomas Walsh, who headed the neurology department at Brigham and Women's Hospital for over a decade before dying in India in 2018. Now, we're going to talk 
a little bit more about Dr. Walsh in a bit. Some sources claim that Anna was working at the Wheatley Hotel in the Berkshires when she met Brian in 2008. Another source claims she met him when she was hired to clean his Boston apartment. But either way, the two met somehow. They fell in love and they got married in Serbia in 2015. And a lot of people who knew Brian and Anna as a couple said they really didn't get it, right? Because Anna was this beautiful Eastern European woman, you know, very glamorous, very Russian doll. She's gorgeous. You can see from her pictures. And Brian was, you know, kind of like a spoiled, like, rich kid who had always been fed by a silver spoon. But we're going to come to find out that Brian had some depth to him, I guess, um, some some issues. You know, he wasn't as straightforward as he may have seemed. Anna and Brian went on to have three sons together who today are aged two, four, and six. The family moved to Cohasset, and it looks like for a while the majority of their income came from various rental properties that they owned and managed around the state. And honestly, from what I can tell, Anna was the savvy business person in the marriage. It did seem like she was the one doing most of the property management, and maybe that caught the attention of some big real estate players because in March of 2022, Anna was offered a job with the prestigious real estate company Tishman Spire based out of Washington, D.C. So for an idea of how huge Tishman Spire is, some of the properties they own and operate include Rockefeller Center in downtown Manhattan, the Franklin in Chicago, the Chrysler Building in New York City, Yankee Stadium, and the list goes on and on. But not just in the United States. They have holdings all over the world, operating in 41 markets, 10 countries, and four continents. So getting this job in D.C. meant a good amount of money. It meant, you know, a, a really good opportunity, but it also meant that Anna would have to live there during the work week and then return to her home and family on the weekends. And, you know, she seemed to be doing very well, financially at least, at the time of her disappearance. Anna owned a lot of properties, including a $1.3 million home in D.C. She also had several properties in Massachusetts and Maryland. And on December 29th, just a few days before she had gone missing, Anna closed a deal for the sale of an apartment in Revere, just outside of Boston. Yes, like Paul Revere. And she ended up making an $80,000 profit from that sale that she planned to reinvest in another rental property. And I'm going to make a quick note to myself to come back to this rental property because there was 10 living in this rental property when Anna decided to sell it and they have had some things to say. And I suppose it was a really good thing that Anna was doing well financially because it did seem that she was the main breadwinner since her husband Brian was on house arrest at the time of her disappearance. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. But first, let's talk about Anna Walsh and the circumstances of her disappearance. Anna was only reported missing when a security guard from Tishman Spire called the Cohasset Police Department on January 4th and requested that a welfare check be done at her home because they personally hadn't seen Anna since December 30th, which was a Friday. And that makes sense because Anna had probably been in D.C. for the work week and then she flew back to to Massachusetts on Friday, and she'd been scheduled to return to D.C. for work on January 3rd, the following Tuesday after the holidays. But she had not arrived back to work, and she wasn't responding to calls or emails. And for the record, there was one other person besides her husband, Brian Walsh, who saw Anna after December 30th and before, you know, she went missing. And that was a family friend um, who ended up going to the Walsh home for a New Year's Eve dinner the evening before Anna went missing. The police report indicates that Anna's employer claimed they had called her husband, Brian, who had also not seen her and who had also not filled out a missing persons report. So that is a big red flag, right? When a woman goes missing and her spouse is not the first one to raise the alarm, especially because it's been several days. And even if your wife's traveling for work, you'd think you'd talk to her at some point. You'd be in contact with her at some point. Now, Brian initially told the police that Anna had woken him up on the morning of January 1st between 4 and 5 a.m., telling him that she had to fly to D.C. for a work emergency. 
He said she got ready, she kissed him and told him to go back to sleep before she hopped into a car sent by a ride service that she normally took to the airport. Cohasset police responded to the welfare check call at around 6.30 p.m. on January 4th at the Walsh home. And at that time, they noticed that the vehicle parked at the house had its seats folded down and there was a plastic liner spread out on the back seat red flag. Now, after Brian Walsh would be arrested, the gray Volvo would be taken into custody and the presence of blood would be found in that car. The police questioned Brian about his movements on the day of January 1st after his wife allegedly left for the airport, and he claimed that he had left his three sons with a babysitter and drove to Swamp Scott, about an hour away from Cohasset, to visit his mother, Diana Walsh, who lived there in an apartment. And while he was there, his mother had him run some errands for her at CVS and Whole Foods. He told the police that he didn't have his cell phone with him on the afternoon of January 1st when he was in Swamp Scott and running these errands for his mother, he said one of his kids had hidden it, and he didn't return home that night until around 8 p.m. So first, the police checked into Brian's story that Anna had left hurriedly that morning to fly to D.C. for a work emergency. And there was no evidence to back that story up. There was no evidence that Anna had ordered her normal car or her normal car service to drive her to Boston Logan International Airport. There was no evidence that she'd taken a flight that day, although detectives found that she did have a plane ticket to D.C. for January 3rd, but she had not used it. Additionally, the police found out that Anna's phone had pinged near her Cohasset home on January 1st and January 2nd, 2023 even though her husband claimed she was not even in the state at that time. From there, the police checked Brian's whereabouts and movements for January 1st, and they pulled surveillance from the Whole Foods and the CVS in Swampscott, where he said he was, but they saw no sign of Brian Walsh on the surveillance footage from those stores. They also found out from Brian's court-ordered bracelet that he'd left the house on the morning of January 2nd, and this was not an approved trip, because remember, Brian Walsh was on house arrest for charges, and I'm going to tell you why soon but they aren't violent charges. It's like white-collar crime. But either way, he was on house arrest until his sentencing for this crime, and he was not supposed to leave the house other than for approved trips. The bracelet that he was wearing was not a GPS tracker, unfortunately. It simply told the police when he left the house and when he returned to the house, but he wasn't supposed to leave the house that morning. Now, when asked why he left the house on the morning of January 2nd, Brian said he was usually allowed to leave, at that time of the day, which was true because that would be usually when he he would be bringing his sons to school, but the boys didn't have school that day. It was a school holiday. So Brian claimed that he'd brought them out for milkshakes in the morning. And in fact, there is surveillance of Brian at a place called Press Juice Bar in Norwell, Massachusetts on the morning of January 2nd. There's really no indication of whether or not his sons are with him. But either way, why would you bring your your three young sons, like two, four, and six, to get milkshakes on a Tuesday morning? (laughs) Doesn't make sense, right? But a lot of stuff Brian Walsh does doesn't make sense. From the juice bar, Brian did something even more interesting, something that was also not an approved trip and which would violate his probation. Brian Walsh was captured on surveillance video at the Rockwell Home Depot around 4 p.m. And he was wearing a black surgical mask and blue surgical gloves, and he was paying $450 in cash for a bunch of stuff, including cleaning products, buckets, mops, tarps, and a full-size Tyvek suit. The day after Anna was officially reported missing and Brian gave his first statement to detectives, Brian reportedly called his landlord and asked if there were surveillance cameras set up at the house because his wife had gone missing. And, you know, Brian wanted to see if there was any sign or any evidence on the surveillance footage about where his wife had gone. And the landlord said, sorry, you know, there are no cameras. Now, keep in mind that January 6th was the day that a massive search began for Anna and law enforcement had not been able to uncover cover all of Brian Walsh's bad behavior by that point because they had to file warrants to get, you know, access to his phone and they had to actually like get these surveillance uh, videos and stuff. So 
she's reported missing on the 4th. They kind of start looking into the stuff on the 5th and the 6th, but they hadn't had all the information yet. But the police chief of Cohasset did say that he found it to be a very strange coincidence when the home that the Walsh family had previously lived in on Jerusalem Road had caught on fire that night, the 6th of January. First responders discovered that the cause of the blaze was pipe damage in the attic, and law enforcement would later claim they didn't believe the fire was connected to Anna's disappearance, but they did find the timing to be very odd. And me personally, I'm not convinced that it wasn't connected, that it wasn't um, somehow maybe set as like a red herring or a distraction, but I don't know. It's just my conspiratorial mind working up. It was only on January 7th that law enforcement began to go through the surveillance footage as well as Brian Walsh's internet search activity where red flag after red flag was raised. Actually, his entire internet search history was one big ass red flag. It's unbelievable to me. It's almost like this guy wanted to get caught. Okay, so let's go back to the surveillance footage. First, the police recovered surveillance footage from January 3rd of a man who looked like Brian Walsh driving a gray Volvo that looked like the car Brian Walsh drove, throwing away what appeared to be a very heavy garbage bag or several very heavy garbage bags into a dumpster at an apartment complex in Abington, not far from Cohasset. Sadly, by the time the police found this footage and went to check the dumpster, the garbage had already been transferred uh, to the facility and destroyed. I believe that in those bags was the dismembered body of Anna Walsh. That is my opinion. I think that that law enforcement probably shares that opinion, although they haven't come straight out and said it. But they did make a very, um, you know, large point of pointing out that you can see Brian, who's allegedly Brian on the surveillance footage, like dragging these bags because they're so heavy. On January 1st, when he said he was visiting his mom, forgot to take his phone with him, said he couldn't find it. So we don't have, like, his phone GPS, but we do have his phone pinging in Abington and Brockton, even though he said he did have his phone with him. So the curiosity of Abington and Brockton was sort of revealed here in court this morning. Prosecutors said that there were several dumpsters at apartment complexes in Abington and Brockton, those two communities that are southwest of Cohasset where he lived, right? Where he and Anna lived. But his mother is almost due north and east. So he wasn't headed to his mother's if he was headed to Abington and Brockton. And they said that the trash facilities there um, incinerated likely the trash bags that he was seen carrying to uh, dumpsters outside of a few apartment buildings in Abington and Brockton. And then there was this detail, trash bags that he was seen hauling and that they were so heavy, he was leaning under their weight before he threw them in the dumpsters. The sad part of this, Marnie, especially since we don't have a body in this uh, murder case, is that they said that those dumpsters were processed and likely incinerated so that that will likely never come to pass. We will likely never see any of those um, actual pieces of evidence. But On January 5th, Brian's cell phone placed him near his mother's apartment complex in Swampscott, and there was surveillance footage of Brian throwing out more garbage bags, um, I believe like by a liquor store that's near his mother's apartment complex. Luckily, law enforcement was able to track those garbage bags to a trash processing facility um, in Peabody, and they searched this facility on January 8th, finding several pieces of evidence, including a hatchet, a hacksaw, tools, cleaning agents, a protective Tyvek suit, very similar to the one that Brian is seen buying at Home Depot, a Prada bag, like the one that Anna Walsh wore, towels, slippers, tape, blood-stained carpet, hunter boots, similar to the ones Anna Walsh was last seen wearing, and a COVID vaccination card with Anna Walsh's name on it. As I said, some of these items did have blood on them, and when the blood was tested, it was determined that both Brian and Anna Walsh had contributed to the DNA in the blood mixture. Um, is that they found Anna Walsh's DNA and Brian Walsh's DNA on items like the Tyvek suit. It's on camera at the Home Depot being purchased by Brian. It's then actually retrieved from dumpsters and then tested Anna Walsh's blood 
Brian Walsh's DNA, not just on the outside of the Tyvek suit, on the inside, like on the inside of the wrist. A search warrant was secured, and when police searched the Walsh home, they found a knife in the basement with blood on it. The blade of the knife was reportedly broken, which you often see in stabbing attacks, uh, especially if these stabbing attacks are especially violent, which I believe this one was. Now, there was also blood found in the basement along with a bloody knife, and that blood was on a Walsh's. Now, it turned out that starting in the early morning hours of January 1st and continuing for the next several day, Brian used one of his son's iPads to make some very suspicious searches online. And literally, this is going to blow your mind. I cannot believe that this... This exists. It's crazy to me. At 4.55 a.m. on January 1st, New Year's Day, Brian searched up how long before a body starts to smell. Three minutes later at 4.58 a.m., Brian searched how to stop a body from decomposing. And at 5.20 a.m., he searched how to bound a body. At 5.47 a.m., he was reading an article titled 10 Ways to Dispose of a Dead Body if You Really Need to. I think... He probably really needed to. And then at 6.25 a.m., he Googled how long for someone to be missing to inherit. Inherit. Like money. Nine minutes later, Brian Walsh asked the internet, can you throw away body parts? And three hours later, at 9.29 a.m., he asked, what does formaldehyde do? Followed by, how long does DNA last? At 9.34 a.m., but I'm not done. At 9.59 a.m., Brian Googled, can identification be made on partial remains? And about an hour and a half later, at 11.30 a.m., he searched dismemberment and best ways to dispose of a body. I guess that article, 10 ways to get rid of a body if you really need to, wasn't efficient enough. Ten minutes later, at 11.44 a.m., Brian asked Google to tell him how to clean blood from wooden floors. And at 11.56 a.m., Brian wanted the Internet to tell him if luminol could detect blood. Yeah, that's kind of its main job. At 1.08 p.m., he asked, what happens when you put body parts in ammonia? And then at 1.21 p.m., he asked the internet, is it better to throw crime scene clothes away or wash them? I mean, <laughs> this is ludicrous. Has this guy never seen an episode of CSI or a true crime documentary or like the news? He's just Googling away like no one's ever going to see it. But his wife's missing, so people are going to see it. Like, that's what I'm saying. Has he never seen any... Any, like, true crime show or documentary? Because you know, even if you're innocent, the first person that's going to be suspected is the spouse. <laughs> you know you told the police she got on a plane and there's no record of her getting on a plane. So what did you think was going to happen? Like, did you think using your son's iPads was going to be good enough because you weren't using your own phone? Like, they don't come in the house and take every single electronic out of there? Like, what did he think was going to happen? What a moron. But we're kind of glad he was a moron, right? Because I think the, the writing's on the wall. Even though he's, like, pleading not guilty. The writing's on the wall. The searches continued on January 2nd. I know, they continued on January 2nd with, uh, quote, hacksaw, best tool to dismember at 12.45 p.m. And can you be charged with murder without a body at 1.10 p.m.? And can you identify a body with broken teeth at 1.14 p.m.? The next day on January 3rd, Brian searched the internet for what happens to hair on a dead body at 1.02 p.m.? And what is the rate of decomposition of a body found in plastic bag compared to on a surface in the woods at 1.13 p.m.? And can baking soda mask or make a body smell good at 1.20 p.m.? And I know we have to do a quick time machine and go back for this internet search, but there was another internet search that Brian Walsh made before his wife went missing, and I want to tell you about it. On December 27, 2022, Brian looked up, what are the best states to divorce for a man? He looked this up just two days after Anna called her mother in Belgrade and asked her to come for a visit the very next day. Anna's mother said that, you know, she felt something must be wrong because Anna simply said to her, like, just please come tomorrow, mama. And Anna would have never asked her to, like, come the next day or you know, be so urgent about it if there wasn't something going on. Murder charges were brought against Brian Walsh on January 17th, but like I said, he's pleaded not guilty. And his lawyer claims they are going to win this case, even though I cannot possibly see how. Like, maybe that's just what 
That's just what lawyers have to say. In an email provided to the media, Tracy Minor, Brian's attorney, said, quote, It's easy to charge a crime and even easier to say a person committed that crime. It's a much more difficult thing to prove it, which we will see if the prosecution can do. End quote. It's actually not that easy to charge someone with a crime, right? You gotta get search warrants. You gotta have like probable cause to get those search warrants. You have to have something from those search warrants to charge the person with the crime. So it's not that easy to charge a person with a crime. I wonder if if like his lawyer didn't see the internet search history, like when she made the statement, I just don't understand. Did she not see him buying a Tyvek suit at Home Depot and then that same Tyvek suit, you know, turning up in the dumpster along with bloody stuff like carpets, bloody carpets, probably that are going to match the carpets he was seen on surveillance buying from Home Goods? Oh, did I tell you that? He bought three carpets from Home Goods and then there's bloody carpets in the dumpster. I wonder if they're the same carpets. Hmm. So I don't know what his lawyers are doing. Is this like false confidence? Fake it till you make it. You know, Samuel Bateman visualization stuff. Because I really don't possibly see how between the Google searches, the fact that he didn't report his wife missing, the weapons found with Anna's blood on them that he threw out, the same weapons he Googled about. Like I said, I guarantee you the three rugs Brian was seen buying from Home Goods after Anna's disappearance, they're the same rugs or carpets found in the dumpster with Anna's blood on them. And remember, he didn't not only not report Anna missing, but he said she'd left town, yet her cell phone pinged at her house on January 1st and 2nd. So unless the state and the DA are literally lying about evidence or withholding other evidence that proves all of this evidence is false and a deep fake, I don't understand. I don't understand. And when you start to look into Brian's background, it gets worse but it also makes some more sense, in my opinion. Because this Brian Walsh is what we call a confidence man, a con artist. Um, pretty much, you know, like a person who's dead inside and uses other people to get what they want and what they need. In 2018, Brian Walsh was indicted by a federal grand jury on fraud charges after he sold two fake Andy Warhol paintings on eBay for $80,000. So the way the story goes is apparently Brian stole two real Andy Warhol paintings from a former college classmate who was living in South Korea. And then he used those real paintings to produce forgeries Not himself. I think he hired somebody to produce these forgeries. And then he sold these forgeries as the real paintings to the Revolver Art Gallery in Los Angeles in 2016. Prosecutors said that in 2011, Brian visited a former Carnegie Mellon University classmate in South Korea. He stayed with his friend and his friend's family. And he was like, oh, you have these like two, you know, Andy Warhol paintings from his Shadow series, the Warhol Shadow series. You should sell these. Like, I can do this. I'm like an art broker. You know, let me sell these for you in the States. Like, it'll be so much easier. And then he had them forged and sold the, the the forged paintings as real paintings. So he's got like all of these crimes. He's stealing from his friend and then he's, you know, committing art fraud. And in April of 2021, Brian Walsh pleaded guilty to one count each of wire fraud, interstate transportation for a scheme to defraud, possession of converted goods, and unlawful monetary transaction. Now, he was allowed to go home and live under house arrest with his little monitoring bracelet on while he waited for his sentencing as long as he was being monitored and Brian would be able to, you know, leave the house for approved reasons because he was the primary caregiver for his three sons because Anna worked out of town throughout the week. While time passed after Brian's guilty plea and before his sentencing, both he and his wife Anna wrote the judge on the case letters, which was basically like them trying to show the judge how much Brian wanted to work on himself, how much he was growing, and essentially asking for a lenient sentence that included no jail time. Brian's letter to Judge Woodlock said, quote, I have created a contract for myself. I am an honest, courageous, loving leader. I repeat this contract to myself on a daily basis. Because of this support and training, I am unwavering in always being true to my word and responsible for all actions, direct and indirect, end quote. I find it interesting that Brian mentions his contract with himself, where he tells himself how great he is and then talks about being appreciative of the support 
that he gives himself. <laughs> like I've made a contract with myself and I tell myself every day that I am an amazing human being who can do no wrong. And because of the support that I'm giving myself, I have the strength to be the good man that I know I am in, inside. He doesn't talk about the support that his wife and his children and his family are giving him. And the support that Anna is giving him is very clearly seen in her letters to Judge Woodlock, where she praised her husband, saying he was the love of her life. He had such a big heart. And he had not only brought so much comfort and joy to their family, but he had nursed her mother through a brain aneurysm that she'd suffered from in December of 2021. Anna said that Brian had saved her mother's life. Anna also told the judge that her husband had reasons for being, you know, a con artist, basically. She said he had suffered extreme childhood trauma at the hands of his abusive parents. She said he had a hard time letting people get close to him, even her, his own wife, because he was afraid of being vulnerable. And she said, quote, he was taught to lie and hide. He was told that he was a loser, that his parents should not have had him that he had no chances of making anything of himself in life, and that he was a lost cause. A deep sense of shame governed his life, end quote. From what I know about Brian Walsh, I feel like a deep sense of shame should govern his life. And, you know, obviously I'm not there. I'm not in his family. I'm, you know, not in the past where he was a child and he, he allegedly experienced this trauma. But from what I can tell, his parents got divorced. His mother sort of like depended on him heavily, still does depend on him heavily. Um, and his father was kind of like absent, um, sort of like out partying and with friends a lot. I don't know if they were like verbally abusive in this way, but I feel like at, at the point when you're an almost 50 year old man, you have to stop blaming what mommy and daddy did to you for the horrendous things that you're doing. Like you didn't steal your friend's paintings and then sell fakes of those paintings because <laughs> your mommy and daddy were mean to you. You did that because you wanted money and you wanted money easy and you didn't want to have to like do a lot of work for it. So obviously Anna thinks very highly of her husband at this point. And in fact, I mean, even when her friends were talking about, you know, Anna and Brian and their relationship, they were like, we didn't see any problems. Like Anna was really like professional. Um, when we were with her, she was all business. She talked about work. She talked about her kids. She didn't really talk a lot about her husband, but she never said anything bad about him. And Anna seems to be like truly supportive and truly in her husband's corner because if it's me, and my husband does this kind of stuff where it's literally putting us in a position where, like, you might go to prison and I have to work out of town. And what am I going to do if you go to prison and you're not here to help me with family? I'm pissed. You know, I'm out. I'm hiring a nanny. And I'm like, Brian, you're on your own. Like, that's it. But clearly she's supportive of him and believes that there's a good person inside of him. But if you talk to Brian Walsh's family and close friends of the Walsh family, they seem to view things a bit differently, a lot differently, actually. In 2019, during a dispute over Brian's father's estate, Brian was described as a dishonest man who had stolen millions of dollars from his father, which had caused the two men to become estranged. So uh, Brian's father is Dr. Thomas Walsh, the neurosurgeon, and he'd actually drafted his will in 2016, at which point in his will, he left his son Brian best wishes and nothing else, writing, quote, you are my son, and I will always hope the best for you, but I do not want to re-engage. If I did, I know that I would be letting mayhem back into my life, and I can't have that, end quote. And I totally get this, right? Some people, although they're your family and you love them, they cause you a great deal of stress and turmoil. And if you want to live a peaceful life, you have to understand that you can't have those people around. You can't have them around just because they're family, because then you're doing that for them, and you're ignoring what, what you need and what's good for you. So he wrote this will in 2016. Keep that in mind. 2016, he drafted the will. After Dr. Walsh passed away in India in 2018, just two years later, Brian reportedly raided his father's $710,000 home in Hull, Massachusetts, and took thousands of dollars in valuable artwork by Salvador Dali and Joan Miro, as well as a car and other luxury items. And then he contested the fact that he'd been cut out of his father's father's will in November of 2019, arguing that he was only one of two legal heirs to his father's estate and that his father, Dr. Walsh, had been in poor health when he'd signed his will. Brian claimed to find the whole will thing very suspicious and even suggested that the signature on it was a forgery. Now remember, 
Dr. Walsh made this will two years before he died. Was he in poor health? I mean, maybe he was an older man, but was he in poor health where he was like on the verge of like passing away? Obviously not because he didn't die till two years later. So Brian's full of shit honestly. In my opinion, allegedly, don't come for me. Brian stated that yes, he and his father had been estranged, but they'd reconnected in 2015 and they'd started speaking regularly in 2016, which isn't reflected in the will, right? In 2016, Dr. Walsh said, I wish you well, but that's all I'm giving you, my well wishes, because I cannot, like, reconnect with you. You're toxic. Andrew Walsh, one of Thomas Walsh's nephews and the executor of Dr. Walsh's will, said, quote, My uncle's last will and testament confirms what he had told many people over the years, that he did not want his son Brian to inherit anything from his estate. He had a severe falling out with his son. Brian had run off with a significant amount of his money. He had almost zero contact with Brian Walsh over the last 10 plus years, end quote. Another man, Dr. Fred Pescatore, a longtime friend of Dr. Thomas Walsh's, added his own opinion in, saying, quote, Brian is not only a sociopath, but also a very angry and physically violent person. I wanted no involvement with Brian in any way, shape, or form. Brian stole money from Tom and swindled him out of almost a million dollars, end quote. It looks like this um, swindling happened when Brian had a rental apartment. I don't have the details written down because I just read it this morning. Like I'm saying, stuff's coming out all the time. But it looks like Brian had a an investment property that he wanted to like go in on with his father. And his father put like a ton of money towards this investment property. And then Brian just like took that money and didn't put it towards the investment property and just like took off. Maybe the investment property didn't even exist. I don't know. But yeah, he stole from his dad, allegedly. Dr. Pescatori also referred to an incident that he witnessed when he was overseas with Brian. And he claimed that he had personally witnessed Brian becoming enraged when some security guards suggested that he was attempting to smuggle antiquities out of the country. I don't know what country it is. I don't know what the antiquities are. They don't get that specific. But I, I believe believe it, right? Knowing what we know about the paintings. Like, yeah, I believe it. Dr. Pescatori said, quote, Brian picked up a stanchion and literally attempted to kill four or five guards, end quote. I mean, he said literally, literally attempted to kill four or five guards. I don't know why um, Brian Walsh isn't in prison for that, probably because he has money and he comes from money. But yeah, maybe he paid him off or something. I don't know. But a man named Jeffrey Orenstein, who'd been a close friend of Brian's father, Dr. Walsh's, for over 35 years, and who claimed he had also lived with Brian Walsh in Manhattan for a short time, he said he'd known Brian since he was 13 and said, quote, Brian is not a trustworthy person and his affidavit is based on lies and misrepresentations, end quote. Jeffrey Orenstein also claimed that Dr. Walsh had told him that Brian had been a long-term patient of the Austin Riggs Psychiatric Center in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where he'd been diagnosed as a sociopath. Um, he did spend time at the Austin Riggs Center. I don't know what he was diagnosed with. I'm sure that's private information. But what it seems like happened is Brian, who came from a wealthy family, he attended boarding school in Rhode Island. Then he attended Carnegie Mellon University in Pennsylvania. But he dropped out during his sophomore year and he checked himself into this psychiatric facility, which is like a very high class, like nice facility. And um, and then he like, I guess he couldn't pay his bill. And he told his parents that he wanted them to pay his bill at the psychiatric facility. So he just like checked himself in there in this high class, like expensive facility. And then he was like, well, I can't pay for it. And then his parents argued over who was going to pay for it because they were like, well, that's not our responsibility. Like dude's an adult. And I guess nobody ended up paying for it. So he got kicked out. And then he kind of bounced around between like three or four colleges and um, and then just kind of ended up like in Boston where he met Anna <laughs> pretty much. I don't even know what he was doing for work. I don't know if he was doing anything for work besides defrauding people. Because Brian Walsh did seem to be like a natural born con man. He even wrote in his journal about how easy it was for him to take advantage of and manipulate those who were closest to him. Like he was bragging about it. You know, he had to tell somebody how slick he was and how easy it was for him to get one over on people who cared about him. We know he stole paintings from one of his friends. He borrowed $500,000 from another friend, never paid him back. Other friends said that Brian liked to attend elaborate, expensive dinners, and then he would ask others to like foot the bill because he never 
brought money and he'd be like, oh, I'll get you next time. But he never seemed to do that. He's like the male version of Anna Delvey, you know, like. <laughs> I do not have time for this. I do not have time for you. Bitch never had her credit card. Always, always said she was going to pay for the next bill, but never, never did. But literally, like, that's that's who we're talking about. Like, con artists like Anna Delvey, like Brian Walsh, people who pretend to be a certain way and make you think they're a certain way, but they're just using you. They're using you. And, you know, he even once used a friend's email address from, like, a company, and he pretended to be the CEO of that company for, like, some scam he was doing, and then the friend got in trouble for this. And uh, Brian Walsh has been accused of depositing more than $30,000 in bad checks. You know, typical stuff like that that you see con people doing. So honestly, it seems like the people who knew him for the longest kind of thought he was a piece of shit thought he was a con artist, thought he was a sociopath, thought he was a user, and just like a toxic bad person. But according to a wrinkled piece of paper that hung in the stairwell of the Walsh's Cohasset home, Brian Walsh was an absolute god among men, with compliments aimed towards him scribbled all over the paper. So it never, I don't think it's really ever explicitly said, at least so far, I think maybe coming out with stuff as we speak, but in my opinion, it looks like the compliments on this paper came from other members of a life coaching group that Brian was a part of, or like a leadership group. And this group was called the Boston Breakthrough Academy. According to their website, the Boston Breakthrough Academy is, quote, an organization passionate about creating leaders and developing human potential, end quote. They offer, you know, leadership development programs. They offer emotional intelligence training to adults in the Boston area. And the weird thing is it appears that this place opened in 2019, like popped up in 2019, and there's a newspaper article saying, like, Boston Breakthrough Center arrives. And then without much explanation, they shut down in 2022. And you can only get to their website now through the Wayback Machine. It's like completely gone. Allegedly, Brian was convinced to join the group by his wife, Anna, who had attended one of their courses when they first opened in 2019. And in a letter to the judge, Woodlock, where she was asking for leniency for Brian, Anna said that she knew the academy would change her husband's life, saying, quote, I experienced the transformation firsthand, and all I thought about was how supportive this program would be for Brian. During this program, he established what integrity was all about, as well as accountability, responsibility, and clear communication, end quote. She wrote this in November of 2021, and from what I can tell, Brian had enrolled in a four-month program at the Boston Breakthrough Academy that began in January of 2020. He paid $2,997 for this like program, and the program would include 16 sessions across five weekends, with these sessions usually lasting more than 12 hours a day. And apparently, Brian was wildly popular in his group at the Academy. He earned the name or the nickname Head and Shoulders because of how cool he was, what a cool guy he was, and how great his hair was. Brian would go on to become involved in the Elite Mastering Leadership Program by 2021, and his fellow group members saw him as a natural-born leader. So I see him as a natural-born con artist, and they see him as a natural-born leader. And that brings us to that wrinkled piece of paper hanging in Brian's house, hanging in a hallway in his house. It actually looks like the paper's hanging in the stairway as you go upstairs. Now, it's not explicitly said, but I've worked in corporate situations before, and I've been forced to attend these leadership seminars and team building conferences. Oh, it's like PTSD, man. This piece of paper looks like a team building exercise that that we've done in these seminars and conferences and stuff before. Um, it's a it's an exercise that's meant to shut down your your negative inner voice and build your individual confidence. You're supposed to keep the paper and look at it when you're having self-doubt. You know, look at what other people think of you and be assured that you're not this bad or weak or unproductive or ineffectual person that your inner voice is telling you that you are. Uh, so they basically pass around papers and they put your name at the top and then they pass around everybody and everyone's supposed to write like one nice thing. Some of the notes that we can read on this wrinkled piece of paper, notes that were to Brian, say, quote, Brian, I just love you. You are what a man, friend, father is. Your humor, love, wisdom, support, courage is inspiring. You are worth everything, end quote. 
Another one said, Brian, you are worthy. You are worth the life you live. And another one said, Brian Walsh, that is your name. Ha <laughs> ha, I'm so used to saying your last name because of MLP. MLP stands for Mastering Leadership Program. Your attention to details and time being open and vulnerability, I acknowledge you for. I so loved being side by side on this journey. End quote. So if this all sounds like kind of a weird culty thing, you know, um, with all the like, acronyms like MLT and, you know, like only using the last name because he's an MLT, like weird stuff like that. Yeah, some people believe that it is a weird culty thing. And from what I can tell, the Boston Breakthrough Academy mimicked other um, LGAT or large group training awareness organizations that have been known to sort of change a person and sometimes lead them to cutting off family and friends who they believe have gotten in the way of their progress or, you know, don't believe in them, or maybe these people aren't as dedicated to self-improvement. Therefore, um, you're told in these groups that, like, the people who don't want to believe in you or who don't support what you're doing here, they're, like, dead weight and they need to be released. It's, like, culty, right? And I read some um, reviews online, and someone said, you know, it's weird because everything's so secretive. Like, a person in a program like this will tell you, like, oh, you've got to do it. You've got to join the program. It will change your life. And then when you ask them questions about, like, well, what is, what do you do or, um, you know, what kind of changes do you see? The person who's in the, the breakthrough, like, Boston Breakthrough Academy or groups like it, they'll say, like, you just have to, you just have to go to see. Like, I can't explain it to you. It's so amazing. You just have to, you have to see for yourself. It's, like, very secretive, you know, because they want you to, like, pay the money. They don't want um, people to, like, go out and tell everyone the secrets that are happening in the group. They want people to, like, recruit others to go in and then, like, pay the money and, and get all of this, like, leadership training. It's just very, very weird to me. Another person on Reddit said, like, his family member completely cut everyone off and got all these new friends. And, you know, he said, like, well, I need new friends. Like, you got to be around the people who you want to be like, not the people who are, like, holding you back, which, like, I get that in some ways. But at the same time, like, that's your family. You don't have to, like, cut them off. You can get new friends and not, like, completely cut your family off when they're not doing anything wrong. They're just not as motivated or driven as you are. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of kind of culty. Like, uh, it reminds me of a lot of, you know, um, organizations that we've talked about in the past, They Who Shall Not Be Named, where they use these, like, weird acronyms and it's, like, this all oh, mystical experience. you got to join it to see, you know, They Who Should Not Be Named. You know who I mean. Wink, wink, not, not, not saying it, not saying it out loud. Not opening that can of worms again. So when members of this group heard that Brian was suspected in the disappearance and then, you know, the murder of his wife, they were reportedly stunned with one woman saying that Brian was amazing, incredibly giving of his time, a good listener and kind. And another member anonymously praising Brian for leading their group in raising $180,000 for a nonprofit that provided food to the hungry in the early days of the pandemic personally, knowing what Brian Walsh has done in the past, I would just check. I would double check, make sure that money actually went to the nonprofit, make sure that nonprofit exists, <laughs> you know, because if Brian's in charge of that money, uh, it probably went in his pocket, not to any hungry people. Okay, so now I want to go back and I want to talk about the Revere property um, in Massachusetts that Anna had sold very shortly before she went missing. Reports have emerged from a woman named Mandy Silva. Uh, she was a tenant who lived there with her husband, Mike Silva, at that Revere rental property outside of Boston, the one owned by Anna and Brian. And she said that she had seen Anna Walsh have a Britney Spears-style meltdown in December. Mandy claimed that she and her husband, Mike, were being forced out of this property, a property that they'd lived in for uh, over four years because Anna was planning to sell the apartment. So Mike Silva... Mandy's husband was actually a contractor who worked for Anna and her husband Brian on different properties. He said he was a contractor and he did maintenance and stuff like that for six Massachusetts properties that Anna owned. And he'd been doing this for eight years for them. And as a result, he and his wife Mandy got discounted rent on their apartment in Revere. Now, Mandy said that Anna usually carried herself very professionally. She always kept her cool. But on this day when they 
kind of had this confrontation, Mandy said, quote, when we put our foot down and said, no, you cannot do this to us, and we were fighting back, it was like watching Britney Spears have a meltdown when Justin Timberlake broke up with her. It was not normal, end quote. Yo, Mandy Silva kind of seems kind of catty. Like, why would you bring Britney into this, man? Okay, she was going through it. She was going through it. Um, and also, like, you're a tenant and you're getting discounted rent, and but you don't live there. That's not your property. So, like, the landlord can tell you, like, I'm selling my apartment. It's my apartment to sell. And so you, you can't live here anymore because we're selling – the apartment, you know? It's weird that she's, like, so put out about it. Mike Silva claims that the Walshes still owe him $25 for work he did on one of their properties, and so he had actually texted both Anna and Brian on New Year's Eve, but he only heard back from Brian, and he didn't hear back from Brian until January 2nd. Mike Silva said, quote, He texted me back, I'm sorry for the delay. I lost my phone, and my son just found it. I'm shocked he didn't say, Sorry for the delay. My wife is missing. Have you heard from her or anything like that? End quote. That's what Mike Silva said. And Mike Silva said also from his point of view, it looked as if Anna Walsh wore the pants in the relationship. And although Brian presented himself as like an investor and like a businessman, he didn't really seem to be doing much. And Mike said every time he went to um, the house that Brian and Anna lived in, Brian would be wearing his bathrobe the whole time and just sort of like hanging out and not really doing anything. And Mike Silva also said Anna was a little flirty and was known to put her husband down with comments such as like, Brian's a little girl. When he scrapes himself, he cries like a little girl. Well, I mean, is Brian crying like a little girl when he scrapes himself? Because if he is, then, you know, valid, valid. And this is starting to make me feel as if maybe Brian Walsh was uh, feeling a bit emasculated. And for someone like him, I don't think it takes much. So do I think that Anna Walsh had like a Britney Spears style meltdown? No. Britney Spears shaved her head and then like went after the paparazzi with like a golf club or like a baseball bat or something. I think that Anna Walsh maybe was going through some stuff, right? Because, you know, it seemed that maybe her and Brian may have been having some problems. Maybe they were fighting. She was asking her mom to come and visit. Brian was looking up, like, best dates to divorce for men, as if, like, <laughs> that's how it works. Like, actually, Nevada's a great state if you're a man. And if you have a penis and you're a man, like, best state to get a divorce from your wife. Like, what is he talking about? It's so, so odd. Definitely, like, a, a man who feels emasculated since he thinks that there's different laws in different states that are going to like benefit the man in the divorce more than the woman. And it's like, I don't think you can just go to a different state and get a divorce. I could be wrong. I'm, I've never been divorced, but I think you have to get divorced in the state you live in. So was he planning to like move to that state, live there for a year and then divorce her? I don't know. I don't know what his plan was. I don't think he has one. So do I think she had like a, a Britney Spears style meltdown? No. I think maybe she was like emotional, maybe like tired, maybe a little like spread too thin considering she's like traveling back and forth uh, from D.C. to Massachusetts every single week. She's got a lot on her plate. She has the weight of the world, the burden of the financial responsibility of the family. She's worried about her husband, like, going to prison, and then she's going to have to figure something out. And, you know, probably um, the Silvas being like, no, like, we're going to stomp our feet and whine about it, and we're not going to move out of this apartment, even though it's your apartment and you own it. And, you know, we can't really tell you that, but, like, no, you're absolutely, we're going to put our foot down. You're not doing this to us. Like, go find a new place to live, man. What the hell's your problem? Do I think she had a Britney Spears-style meltdown? No, and I think it's really tacky and catty of Mandy Silva to be speaking about Anna like this when she's not here to defend herself. And she doesn't know what the hell's going on. And, like, the woman's missing and could be dead. And you're being kind of a bitch. Just my opinion, Mandy. Just my opinion. There also appears to be a connection between Anna Walsh and two men who were arrested in Washington, D.C. in April of 2022. And these two men were accused of impersonating federal agents. On April 6th, FBI agents raided a luxury D.C. apartment building where many government employees and members of the media lived. And this same building was being managed by Anna Walsh on behalf of her company, her real estate company, um, Tishman Spire. Now, according to court documents, I'm going to get these names wrong, okay, but you just got to bear with me. Aryan Taharzadeh and Hader Ali portrayed themselves as federal law enforcement agents involved in covert operations on behalf of the Department of Homeland Security. But in reality, neither man was employed by the U.S. government, although they were able to convince several actual government employees 
that they were legitimate. And apparently they used this apartment building to like run this operation. They pretended to recruit other individuals to their fake operation. Like some someone told a story of where the these two men had like fake guns maybe, like cap guns, and they pretend to like shoot someone and they were like, oh, see, now we saved you. <laughs> and these uh, two men, they also used their fake law enforcement status to get close to several government employees in high-level and sensitive positions, including many Secret Service agents, including a Secret Service agent on First Lady Jill Biden's security detail. <laughs> you know, doesn't get much more sensitive and, and close to the president than that. You know, that's crazy to me. According to court documents, quote, they compromised United States Secret Service personnel involved in protective details and with access to the White House complex by lavishing gifts upon them, including living rent free. And they procured, stored and used all the tools of law enforcement and covert tradecraft weaponry, including firearms, scopes and brass knuckles, surveillance surveillance equipment, including a drone, antenna, hard drives, and hard drive copying equipment, tools to manufacture identities, including a machine to create personal identification cards and passport photos, and tactical gear, including vests, gas masks, breach equipment, police lights, and various law enforcement insignia, end quote. So in this apartment building in D.C. that Anna Walsh managed, the two men appear to reside and hold multiple apartments. It looks like five apartments in one penthouse. And, um, One of the Secret Service agents or the government employees that they were trying to get close to, they basically let this dude live rent-free in the penthouse, I believe, and it was like a $40,000 a month um, rent. And they were like, oh, yeah, you can live here, you know, if you give us access or do what we want. I don't know. Like, I don't understand how a Secret Service agent could be so easily duped. Like, we might have to go back to the drawing board with the Secret Service training, okay? And even worse, they searched these apartments. They found a bunch of weapons in these apartments, like a lot. Um, It's actually really, really scary how many, like, tactical, like, weapons with scopes, like, bulletproof vests, a lot lot of ammo. It's terrifying. Terrifying. Um, I'm going to actually link the affidavit or sign an affidavit. It's like the report, I guess, or like the court filing when when one of these guys got brought to trial and it kind of goes over every single thing they found. I will link it in the description box if you want to look it over because you should know what's going on in your world. And this is terrifying. Now, I bring this up because residents of that apartment building now claim that they believe Anna Walsh was hiding information about the two men who were, you know, basically running free around that building storing weapons, doing some really shady stuff. So I'm going to read from this New York Post article. It says, quote, members of the tenant association in the crossing building, which houses journalists and government workers in the upstart Navy Yard neighborhood near the Capitol, say they fear that Aryan Tehazade and Hader Ali will avoid a full public airing of their actions and that Walsh's employer, Tishman Spire, is withholding scandalous details from them. Anna Walsh was described to the Post as very forceful and shady in her handling of the av- aftermath of the scandal, even claiming to tenants on one occasion that she wasn't Anna Walsh in an apparent effort to duck their questions following the April 6th FBI raid that busted Ali and Terrazade. Terrazade pleaded guilty in August to crimes including conspiracy, unlawful possession of a large capacity ammunition feeding device, and voyeurism. Ali pleaded guilty in October to conspiracy, bank fraud, and unlawful possession of a large capacity ammunition feeding device. Many questions remain unanswered about the bizarre case in which the duo stockpiled tactical gear, weapons, ammunition, and surveillance equipment while providing free rent to a Secret Service agent and lavishing gifts and flashing badges to an army of local and federal law enforcement officers while claiming to represent the non-existent U.S. Special Police. One tenant provided the Post with a photo of what one of the imposters said was a master key code, meaning that may have been able to plant cameras throughout the building, as questions remain about whether they were associated with foreign actors as well as Washington security agencies while infiltrating the complex. I am very concerned about the voyeurism allegations, and after the men pled guilty, I attempted multiple times to gain information regarding which areas and units had been impacted, and if mine had been one of them, but never received any answers. A female member of the Tenant Association's board, who asked not to be identified by name, told The Post, I believe the management team here is doing everything they can to avoid sharing any information about the situation at all, even information not covered by an 
investigation, which makes me believe the information they are withholding could be considerably detrimental to them. A person who lived in the complex and was close to the two men whom building management leaned on when security issues occurred said that, quote, I was able to witness much of the infiltration's inner workings. They were able to establish audio and video surveillance in and outside their units as well as potentially other areas of the property. End quote. The source goes on to say, quote, I personally viewed on Aryan's phone video footage showing residents engaged in nefarious behavior from cameras in other areas of the building which were not connected to the ones in their individual units. End quote. The source goes on to say, quote, at times Aryan had used cameras throughout the property to find me rather than call when he wanted to talk to me in person, which made it obvious that he either had access to the building's common area cameras or was able to establish his own system throughout the property. Furthermore, Aryan and Hader had expressed that specific cameras in the building were theirs and not management's, end quote. One tenant who requested anonymity to share candid recollections about Anna Walsh called her, quote, a wolf in sheep's clothing and, quote, a very fake person who alternated between a power woman persona and a meek manner while seeking to shut down or placate inquiries about how Hader and Tarazada managed to score five units in the upscale building for which they allegedly failed to pay $222,000 in rent from late 2020 through spring 2022. Walsh lied to people and said things that she wanted you to hear in the moment, one resident recalled. At the time of her disappearance, Walsh was on the receiving end of resident demands for the result of an internal security review. Walsh participated in a September 19th meeting with the Tenant Association Board and wouldn't share any information about the status of the review, which the company first disclosed in a May email to residents. A representative of Tishman Spire, which manages an array of other properties, defended the company Friday, telling the Post that after the September meeting with the tenants, no additional questions were ever submitted to building management. The Tenant Association fired back, telling the Post that questions were raised before and during the meeting that were not answered and that additional verbal follow-ups were pursued. Setting up the September meeting, an association member said, was like pulling teeth. The corporate rep also pointed the Post to a May 5th email to tenants before the voyeurism allegations emerged, attempting to reassure renters after a preliminary internal review. The communication said that the company confirmed that neither of the defendants' codes was used or could have been used to enter any other residents' units without directly addressing their claim to have had a universal access code, which remember is what one tenant said she saw on one of the guy's phones. The email confirmed that the phony agents had a hard copy building directory they had misappropriated, but that resident information included in the misappropriated directory was limited to name, unit number, phone number, and email address. How did they get that? How did they get that that list, that uh, building directory? Late Friday, a spokesman for Tishman Spire issued another statement to the Post saying, quote, the safety and security of our residents, staff, and guests are our top priority. We have fully cooperated and actively assisted federal authorities throughout their investigation and are grateful for their care and thoroughness. We have communicated regularly with our residents through this process. The article goes on to say Walsh, whom tenants recall speaking with a thick Eastern European accent. Why is that? Why does that matter? She's from Eastern Europe. <laughs> Why does it ma- why does that matter, tenants? You guys are not helping your case. She was put in charge of the building at roughly the time of the April raid, and tenants say it's unclear if she was chosen to navigate the scandal or if her role began shortly beforehand. In addition to claiming to being part of the Department of Homeland Security, the Justice Department says Ali boasted that he had links to Pakistani intelligence and possessed a passport with two Iranian visas from 2019 to 2020, as well as three older Pakistani visas. For nearly eight months, Crossing D.C. management has refused to provide any answers or clarity when it comes to resident safety and security following the FBI raid, Nathaniel Hunt Kelly, president of the Tenant Association, told The Post. Rather, he said, they've done everything they can to obfuscate information from residents and the general public. Those living here have felt great concern and are left with more questions than answers. Tishman Spire, in my experience, will operate within the grayest areas of the law, lie to individuals who seek answers, and provide little to nothing for residents' peace of mind. Court filings reveal some details of the infiltration operation, describe what could be a plot of spy thriller movie. This is the court filing that I read. Quote, Tarazadi stated that Ali had obtained the electronic access codes and a list of all of the tenants in the apartment complex, according to one court filing from authorities. Tarazadi further stated that Ali was the individual that funded most of their day-to-day operation, but Tarazadi did not know the source of the funds. Authorities say they seized guns, sniper scopes, a drone, police lights, protective vests, gas masks, breach equipment, and law enforcement insignia and equipment to make fake IDs. 
crazy. One member of the Secret Service was allowed by the men to live rent-free in a penthouse from February 2021 to January 2022 at a market cost more than $40,000, while another federal law enforcement officer's rent in the building also was covered, authorities say. That's why they had so many... So they had so many apartments in that same building, the building that Tishman Spire managed and the building that apparently Anna Walsh was put in charge of being the property manager of shortly before this FBI raid. So I don't know. Listen, there's one reason I bring this up. The one reason I bring this up is because I'm worried and wondering if Brian's lawyers will attempt to use it to raise reasonable doubt during a trial. Like Anna was involved with some bad stuff. Anna was involved with some shady people. They're the ones who got to her, not me. That's like reasonable doubt, I guess. But also, do I think the whole thing with the apartment building and these two guys pretending to be like Homeland Security agents, do I think that's shady? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. A million times over, yes. How did they get there? Like, Tishman and Spire must have known who they were claiming to be, but they didn't, like, look into it, I guess. I don't know. What I find very odd is that Anna's mother, Malinka Lubjivek, Lubjivek? I'm only going to call her Malinka from now on because I absolutely can't say that last name. Lijubek? Lijubikic? I can't do it. Um, Malanka's originally from Serbia. She, she lives there. Um, Milanka's publicly claimed that she does not believe Brian would hurt her daughter. She said, quote, my son-in-law would not do anything to harm my Anna, and I do not believe any of the statements that have so far been related to the possibility that Brian harmed her. He assured me that Anna is fine and alive, and I believe him. I'm shocked by the new details that she was allegedly killed because I still hope that she is alive and well." End quote. I I, th I find it odd, and like I guess um, Brian helped Malinka, you know, nursed her back to health after like an aneurysm. So maybe she has some sort of loyalty to him. Maybe she truly does see him as like this good person, who who couldn't possibly do anything to her daughter. But like that's your daughter, and she's missing. And did you see the Google searches? <laughs> like maybe maybe she said this before the Google searches and the surveillance footage and everything else. Maybe she doesn't know. No, she definitely knows her son-in-law is like an art thief because she sent a letter to the judge too, being like, he's awesome, he's amazing, like go go easy on him. So she definitely knows that he's like a con artist. So I don't know. Now, one day ago, Fox News posted an article that said Anna Walsh's mother sends formal request from Serbia for documents related to murder case. Milanka, who lives in Belgrade, Serbia, is working with the country's foreign ministry to obtain information regarding Walsh's January 1st disappearance, which has since been ruled a murder, the Associated Press reported. Milanka, through the foreign ministry, submitted a formal request to Serbia's consulate in New York and all relevant parties seeking to be designated Walsh's next of kin and to receive documentation pertaining to her daughter's case, according to the report. So maybe that's why... Um, Milanka wants to see this information because she wants to see everything that there is before, you know, once again, publicly supporting Brian. I think once she does see, you know, she'll she'll come around and and understand what happened here, because I think it's pretty clear what happened here. Right. Um, you know, he's going on trial innocent until proven guilty, all that jazz. But in my opinion, Brian Walsh has always been a con artist. His wife was a professional boss bitch who was making a lot of money who clearly knew what she was doing with real estate. And I think, you know, it looks like Brian Walsh was, you know, trying to get into the real estate game like early on when he swindled his father for money. But then Anna comes up in and she's like, here, let me do this. And she's amazing at it, right? Like clearly she was making a lot of money. She had a lot of rental properties, very lucrative. I think she was doing so well with her personal rental properties that she got the attention of Tishman Spire. And they were like, yes, come work for us. Like give us your skills. And he probably felt like, kind of resentful about it and so now she's got a lot of money and he's sitting in the house in his bathrobe all day taking care of three kids and he can't even leave the house unless you know the daddy police tell him he can and he's not able to make money is not able to contribute and even if he was able I don't think he could have because I just don't think he was competent in that way I think he'd been conning people and blaming everyone else for his problems and his shortcomings all his life that he literally just didn't know how to be competent and productive in, in any kind of business. And so he was resentful. And, you know, like even, what's his name, Mike Silva said, it kind of seemed like Anna wore the pants. Some men don't like that. Now, some men should 
and are happy to, you know, sit home and be a house husband while their wife makes a crap load of money. And they're happy with that because, like, who wouldn't be, right? Like, I would be a housewife. Absolutely. You know, if, like, my husband was making, like, a million dollars a year, like, I, w- I wouldn't work. I would stay home and hang out and go to the gym and, you know, play with my kids and stuff. Like, it's, who wouldn't like that? But some men even though they like kind of like it, they also feel like shame for it. And they're like, I'm emasculated. I'm emasculated. And so he's going to this leadership program, right? And they're all like, Brian, you're amazing. And he's feeling good about himself. And he's getting pumped up. And he's like, I am. I'm head and shoulders. And I'm an amazing leader. And, you know, I'm I am worth the life I live. And I'm an amazing father. And I'm everything a man should be. That's what my friends in my leadership group say. And so Anna doesn't appreciate me as the the man I am. She just sees me as this house husband. And I am so much more than that. I have so much more to offer than that. And I think he was like, I'm just going to kill her. I think that there was anger. Um, but it also had to do with money because, you know, he's asking about inheriting and he's asking best states to divorce for men, meaning like I want to make sure I get her money. And um, I think that he wanted the money from her and he wanted to inherit her money. But also, I, I do think this probably wasn't planned out. Um, he probably did it like in, in, in anger. I think he had a lot of anger towards her, a lot of resentment that he probably pushed down and it came out because the the fact that the knife was found broken lets me know it was a violent and aggressive attack. This wasn't something where it's like, I just want her out of my life. It was like, I want to hurt her. I'm angry at her. I hate her. And that's concerning because it seemed like Anna really was a supportive and loving wife up until the very end. On December 31st, New Year's Eve, Anna and Brian had their friend Jem Mutlu over for dinner. And the dinner started at 8.30 p.m. And, you know, he left around 1.30 a.m. on January 1st. So he's the last person besides Brian to see Anna alive. And when asked, you know, what was Anna like? Were they fighting? What was going on that night on New Year's Eve? He said, quote, there was a lot of looking forward to the new year. There was no indication of anything other than celebrating the new year. Problems on hold. She was texting with friends. She was sitting next to me at the bar stool in their kitchen. There was absolutely no indication that any modicum of tragedy, disappearance, or anything else could have happened that night, end quote. Brian had cooked an elaborate meal for us, and we hugged and celebrated and toasted and just what you do over New Year. Both Anna and and Brian have been individually and, and together very impactful on my life. Um, a part of me had this this suspicion all along that there may have been foul play and that 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 somehow it just the story wasn't adding up. Believe it or not, I still have a modicum of uh, hope that somehow <laughs> I think you got it. Also, I do want to say, though, around that time, Anna did make phone calls to her mother, her older sister, and a friend of hers who'd been her maid of honor at her wedding, but none of them answered. I don't think this was a phone calls like, oh, help me, I'm in trouble. I think that they were phone calls like, Happy New Year, you know, when it hits midnight, like everyone calls their loved ones and their friends and says, Happy New Year. It seemed like Anna was a loving and supportive wife up until the very end because just a few hours before her death, she wrote a a message in red marker on the side of a champagne bottle box. And this was a message to her husband. The message said, wow, 2022, what a year. And yet we are still here and together. Let's make 2023 the best one yet. We are the authors of our life, courage, love, perseverance, compassion, and joy. Love, Anna. So this was a Lansom Noble Cuvée champagne box that was found in their dining room of the Walsh home. And I did want to touch on the children, the three sons of Anna and Brian Walsh, um, two, four, and six years old. They are actually currently in the custody of the state. And Anna's friends are trying to you know, get custody of the children until the case is resolved. A friend of the family, Natasha Sky, told Fox Boston that two families are going through the legal process in an attempt to gain custody. She said, there are two families who have had play dates over and over already. There are two families who are willing to adopt and take all three boys together, end quote, basically, so that the, the kids don't get separated. I mean, that's that's amazing because if you think about it, they, they're going to lose both of their parents. I 100 million percent believe that Brian Walsh is going to go to prison 
Um, I, I believe that Anna Walsh, sadly, is, is no longer alive. And uh, they, they're going to lose both of their parents in one foul sweep or one foul swoop, whatever. They're going to lose both of their parents. And they're going to need that um, familiarity of like family friends and they're going to need each other. So I'm glad they're going to be kept together. So I mean, basically what we're looking at is something happening to Anna between 1.30 a.m. when Jem Mutlu left the house and like 4.30-ish a.m. when Brian Walsh started Googling things about like dead bodies and stuff. I mean, unless he was Googling that like before, but why would you Google it before you killed her because, you know, he didn't go to Home Depot and get the tarps and the cleaning equipment and all of that stuff till after, which makes me feel like it wasn't premeditated, right? If he was going to, um, you know, premeditate and plan it, he would have gone and gotten that stuff like before and had it ready so that, you know, he wouldn't. What also terrifies me to think of is those three boys were in that house when this happened to their mother. Um and, and I don't know. Like, I don't know. It probably did happen in the basement because that's where they found the blood and the knife. So hopefully you didn't hear anything. But something happened to her between 1.30 and like 4.30 in that three-hour period. There was an argument. She was murdered by her husband. And then he probably dismembered her body and threw it out in those garbage bags. And I don't think that those garbage bags are going to be found, which is what he was hoping because he was Googling, like, can you get charged with murder without a body? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, so let me know what you think about all of this. Like I said, stuff's coming out every day, so I'll keep an eye on it and just, you know, see anything new and what's happening. But Brian's going to plead not guilty. Um, he has pleaded not guilty. He's got this shit-eating grin on his face when he's being, like, arrested. He's clearly, like, a psychopath. He doesn't care. And I think that um, he and his lawyer are going to have a really hard time trying to show that he's anything but 100 million percent guilty. So let me know what you think about this in the comment section. Don't forget to hit like if you like this video. Don't forget to share it if you think it's worth sharing. And subscribe. Please subscribe if you haven't already because so many of you are watching regularly but you're not subscribed yet. So subscribe. That way you get notified every time I post a new video or go live, which I'm going to try to start doing more. I used to go live every week and now I'm just so exhausted at night, but I do want to go live and talk about these cases after we cover them so that we can like have a deeper discussion and really cover some updates and stuff. So yeah, don't forget to subscribe. Follow me on social media, Twitter and Instagram handles are in the description box. Also in the description box, you'll find links to my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every week with retired police detective Derek Lavasser. You can get the podcast anywhere you get your audio podcast, but we also have a YouTube channel. The link is in the description box. Thank you all so so much for being here. Uh, really rough case. I hope that that justice is served, but really rough case in general. But until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. I'm